Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is Wednesday, November 8th at 10.08 a.m., and we are here today at 1520 Market Street uh, for the third public hearing on uh, CDBG funding recommendations and our 2024 annual action plan. I'm going to try and share my screen here so that we can walk through this presentation. And let me know if you all can see that. Thank you very much. I'll not at all. I appreciate the flag. Uh, we're also lucky to have uh, a number of folks here in person. Um, and uh, uh, we'll have a sign up sheet going around. And if you could fill that out, please, that would be wonderful. So uh, agenda for today, we're going to talk just a little bit about CDA, about uh, the HUD formula programs and the process by which the city allocates those funds. Um, and then we're going to go through the board bill um, and through uh, the city's funding recommendations um, for uh, annual act, our 2024 annual action plan. And then we'll take any questions, any public comment, um, and are excited to hear from you all. Um, so with that, CDA is one of the city's development agencies. We serve as a clearinghouse for federal funds uh, for the city of St. Louis, and we are charged by Mayor Jones uh, with deploying these funds to drive economic justice, uh, by which we mean economic empowerment activities to provide social services and lift up our community, as well as neighborhood transformation and community-driven development activities to change the physical uh, landscape of St. Louis with a particular focus on affordable housing. Um, and I'm happy to share that we currently have um, at CDA over 1,700 units in the affordable housing production pipeline, and that's a significant expansion uh, over historic trends. A little bit more history, um, CDA was founded in 1974 in order to administer Housing and Community Development Act funds. Uh, and the Housing and Community Development Act uh, established essentially the CDBG program um, and dramatically expanded HUD funding. And CDA was established in order to manage this new uh, revenue stream that was coming into the city of St. Louis. Um, CDA originally uh, also uh, included uh, the planning department, but in 1999, the planning department was split off from CDA. And then similarly in 1988, SLDC was established um, and SLDC is uh, a instrumentality of the city, but formerly uh, formally a nonprofit corporation um, that is primarily funded uh, through the city and through CDA. Um, another note is that in 2012, from 2012 to 2014, HUD essentially came in and intervened um, in order to dramatically redesign the city's uh, process for administering HUD funds. Because basically what they found, they came in, they did a monitoring visit and they found there's way too much political influence um, in how the city is avoiding and administering these funds. Um, and that's why they actually were the ones who required us to issue a request for proposals and hold a competitive funding cycle. Um, so that's why now ever since uh, that intervention, um, we have really run a competitive um, uh, competitive process um, that is driven by our staff's ratings. Um, and that's what we did again this year, and we'll get into that. But essentially, every project that comes in is rated by three members of our staff. We average out those ratings, and then we award the highest rated projects. So with that, a little bit about the formula grants programs process. And there's four formula grants that the city receives, uh, CDBG, HOME, ESG and HOPLA. And we'll talk about each of these a little bit more in a moment, but all four of those go through the same process. And that process involves first, a five-year consolidated plan. First of all, a five-year consolidated plan um, where we tell HUD, what are our goals? What are our objectives? What are we trying to do with these funds? Next, we do annual action plans. Um, so each year, oh wow. I'm going to project. Uh, if you can't hear me, uh, I'll, okay. Uh, but you're also in the front, Rashada. Uh, um, but in any case, uh, so the five-year consolidated plan is the really critical document. Um, and actually, I'm excited to share that we are going into our next consolidated planning process starting in January 2024. That consolidated plan, we're currently in the 2020 to 2024 consolidated plan. 
and we'll be going into our 2025 to 2029 consolidated plan. And that's going to be an opportunity to have a deeper conversation about our priorities for these programs and really excited to engage in a dialogue with the folks here in the community more broadly about that. Um, so we will launch that process in January 2024, and then we will submit our 2025 to 2029 consolidated plan on November 15th, 2024. Right now, however, we are talking about our 2024 annual action plan because we have this five-year plan and then we provide each year. Here's our plan for how we're going to meet the objectives and goals set forth in the five-year consolidated plan. Then once we submit that action plan to, sit, uh, to HUD, uh, we enter into a grant agreement with HUD uh, whereby uh, we can actually start dispersing and deploying these funds. And then finally, once we finish spending the funds or once that year uh, comes to a close, once uh, the 2024, for example, fiscal year comes to a close, we have to submit a consolidated action plan performance report 90 days after, where basically we tell HUD, here's how these programs went. Here, here are the outcomes. Here, here are the uh, metrics. Here is the uh, performance of these programs. Um, and so that's really the cadence of how these formula programs work. First, we tell HUD, here's our five-year plan. Then we tell HUD, here's our one-year plan. And then we tell HUD, 90 days after, here's here's how we did. Uh, here's how we stack here. This is what we plan to do. Here's what we actually uh, managed to do. So right now, we are talking about the 2024 annual action plan. And so let's focus in now on how this process has uh, has moved. Uh, and we posted this timeline on June 30th. And something else I'll flag here is that we are required um, by HUD to develop a citizen, a public participation plan um, required under uh, 24 CFR 91.105. Um, and uh, essentially what that provides is that we have to go through a public process with iterative feedback uh, over multiple. Um, I don't know that I can make it larger, but I can talk through it and explain the lines. Um, and if necessary, we can also print out this slide deck for the folks in the room. Yeah. yeah. I know it's like this. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so, so in accordance with our public participation plan, we essentially take public participation at multiple steps in the process. First and foremost, we held a public hearing on July 21st to discuss our funding priorities and collect public input on our funding priorities. Then we issued our request for proposals. This is where we invite the community to submit their proposals uh, for funding. Uh, then we held another public meeting uh, where we provided an overview and explained the RFP and answered questions, as well as a capacity building training uh, where we answered, again, questions from prospective applicants. Once CDBG proposals came in, that's where we went through the rating process that I described. And every single proposal that came in was rated by three CDA staff. We averaged those, um, and then we identified our funding recommendations by setting thresholds. And I'll share that the thresholds that we set were 90 points uh, for new programs and 85 points for previously funded programs. That's because we understand that continuity is important, and we want to make sure that we are giving programs that we funded historically every chance to retain their funding. Um, but nonetheless, those thresholds were 90 points uh, for new programs and 85 points for previously funded programs. Then we submit our action plan uh, to the Board of Aldermen for approval. Um, and this bill authorizes CDA to enter into the grant, to submit the action plan, to enter into the grant agreement with HUD, and to spend the money. It appropriates the funds. Um, and so we have now gone through that process. We held another public hearing at the HUDS committee on uh, the week of, uh, uh, of October 9th, but it, in fact, it was on October 10th at 11 a.m. Um, and then uh, the Board of Aldermen reviewed the bill. Um, typically, uh, and in fact, uh, for the last decade, they have not made any changes to the bill. HUD significantly discourages any changes to the bill because they don't want it to be politically driven. They want it to be driven by CDA staff um, and expert reviews. Um, and then the Board of Aldermen uh, held, uh, passed the bill out, um, and it is currently on the mayor's desk for signature. Um, now we are holding this public hearing to collect input on a final uh, kind of a final round of input 
Um, but really the purpose is to inform uh, our processes moving forward and our priorities moving forward. Um, and we'll talk more about that uh, shortly and happy to answer any questions about that as well. Um, but then finally, we are tasked with submitting our annual action plan to HUD uh, by November 15, 2023. And again, this is a deadline, a legal deadline that we, we are required to submit our annual action plan 45 days prior to the beginning of the action plan year, uh, which is January 1st, 2024. So that's the timeline. A little bit now about the types of funds that we are talking about and their eligible uses, because I think that's really important to inform the discussion is what can we actually use these funds for? Um, the biggest category of funds is community development block grant funds. And those can be used for three purposes. One, benefiting low to moderate income households. Um, and when we say low to moderate income, uh, what we mean is for a is someone who makes under 80% of our area median income. Yeah. Do you need some water, ma'am? Donna, can we get her some water? Okay. Um, uh, under 80%, no, it's perfect, all right. Under 80% of area median income. Um, 80 me area median income uh, is actually defined on a regional level, so it's quite high. Uh, it's higher than you might expect for the city of St. Louis, but if you're a uh, individual, uh, you are low to moderate income if you make under $53,000. Uh, and if you're a family of four, the threshold is $75,900. So you can see that when we talk about serving low to moderate income people, those are the thresholds that we are talking about. Um, and, and some of those individuals might be considered solidly middle class, at least as far as I would, would think about it myself. Um, the second category of eligible uses uh, is elimination of slums and blight. Um, and that essentially means uh, addressing uh, buildings which are derelict uh, or unsafe uh, and um, beautification activities and, and things of that nature. Um, and so essentially, even if it doesn't directly serve an individual who's low to moderate income, we can still fund the activity if it is serving the neighborhood and eliminating a blighted neighborhood. And then finally, the third use is urgent need. Um, but this, I'll flag, is really used very sparingly by HUD. It really requires a natural disaster of some sort um, to allow us to rely uh, on this uh, justification. And then below each of these national objectives, every single dollar that HUD spends, that's, that's spent from CDBG funds, needs to meet one of these three national objectives. But then there's a lot, uh, an even longer list of eligible activities. Um, and so that is what really defines whenever we fund something, we have to find this is the eligible activity that it fits under. And we'll talk about some of those uh, in a moment as well. Um, I also want to flag that some CDBG funds have even more restricted uses. Um, and right, and we've received two special allocations of CDBG funds, CDBG CV funds, coronavirus response funds, as well as CDBG DR disaster relief funds in response to the, the uh, July 22 flooding. And we are working to develop the allocation plan for those funds um, with HUD um, uh, in order to be able to deploy those. The CV funds, the coronavirus response funds are already fully programmed and largely spent. The disaster relief funds, uh, we are in the beginning stages of that process and we'll be holding additional public in, uh, public hearings for input on the DR funds. I will share that at a very high level, our number one priority is to provide direct relief to households impacted by the flood, to build the city's capacity to respond to flood events in the future, and to invest in floodplain management uh, and green infrastructure. Um, the next tranche of funds that we are talking about are home investment investment partnership funds. And these funds are uh, also more restricted in that they can only be used to build housing to benefit persons of low and moderate income. That's the only eligible use. Um, and you'll see that the way we've deployed those funds uh, or, or are in uh, deploying those funds in the action plan is solely for that purpose. We have also received a special allocation of home ARP funds, um, ARP referring to the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and this is a uh, tranche of $10.6 million, um, which was awarded to the city uh, on a formula basis uh, to serve individuals who are unhoused, at risk of becoming unhoused, victims of domestic violence, and individuals uh, with substance abuse uh, challenges. Uh, these are the four qualifying populations, and we will be deploying these funds uh, for the large part. We've already committed um, 
about $1 million uh, to a uh, hotel, uh, or rather a motel acquisition and conversion project to provide 20 uh, units of permanent supportive housing. Uh, but we will be deploying the remaining 9 million roughly in funds pursuant to our February housing production NOFA. So again, inviting folks to apply uh, for those housing dollars to serve these four qualified populations. The final two funding sources that we're talking about uh, today are emergency solutions grant dollars, um, which are administered uh, by the Department of Human Services to provide basic shelter and supportive services to the unhoused, as well as uh, housing opportunities for persons with AIDS dollars, uh, which provide funding uh, for uh, housing individuals living with HIV and AIDS. And those funds are administered by the city's Department of Health. But CDA uh, manages the overall reporting to HUD uh, and the action plan and the consolidated planning process. So with that, what is our 2024 annual action plan? Um, it involves $18 million in community development block grant funds, uh, $3 million in home funds, $1.6 million in emergency solutions grant dollar uh, grant funds, and $3.1 million in HOPWA funds, as well as the $10.6 million in home ARP funds. I'm not sure, Tommy, by the way, why this seems to be lagging my... Um, I'm sharing the screen. It takes me a second. Oh, I thought I was sharing the screen. Okay. The screen is my screen. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, but you can see the uh, awards there. And now I'm moving to the next page. Okay. <clears throat> and here you can see just a high level overview of some of the organizations that we fund. And you can see it's split up in a lot of different categories. We provide youth services, after school, summer internships, food access programs, job training programs, senior services, homeless services, economic development, public improvements, administration, uh, beautification, fair housing, utility assistance, um, and a variety of other uh, services, as well as our investments in affordable housing. And then we also fund a variety of public entities. Tommy, if you can move to the next slide. Um, we also fund a variety of public entities uh, and, and city departments uh, to provide services as well. So with that, um, we are now arriving at a more detailed set of our 2024 funding recommendations to walk through. If you can go to the next slide, Tommy, um, where you will see that our uh, our awards or, or our, uh, our allocations are uh, distributed among these different eligible activities. So we have one eligible activity is public services. And this is really uh, the most uh, flexible uh, pot of funds, which is where we fund youth services, senior services, food, et cetera, out of. Uh, then there's interim assistance, which is really intended for, uh, uh, that's a slums and blight national objective um, and is really intended to beautify our neighborhoods. Um, there's low to moderate income homeowner assistance, as well as affordable housing construction and rehabilitation, economic development investments, public improvements, and planning and administration. And something that I'll share that is a really important contextual note for all of this is that two categories here, public services and planning and administration are capped. Um, we don't control how much is awarded under those, um, under those uh, sections. Uh, public services is capped at 19% of our CDBG uh, awarded funds and uh, planning and administration is capped at 20%. So with that, let's dig into public services and our awards. So we again, we held all this, uh, all these hearings. We uh, we held a competitive funding cycle, and then we awarded, uh, we selected the following programs um, to provide public services. And many of these are uh, programs that we have historically funded for years. Um, the first is Big Brothers Big Sisters of Eastern Missouri Youth Mentoring Program. Uh, we also funded the Department of Parks and Recreation Expanded Rec Program, where they provide after-school activities. Um, uh, Employment Connection um, is being funded for the first time uh, for its youth programming focused in Dutchtown. Um, and Gene Slave Boys and Girls Club is being funded again for its after-school and summer programming, um, as is Guardian Angel Settlement Association, which is an early childcare facility, and Mission St. Louis is beyond 
on school program, which provides tutoring and after school activities uh, to, uh, to children. And I'll note that overall, these, uh, and actually there's two more use services programs. There is the Gateway Go program, which is a program with Slate and Bi-State, whereby we provide a thousand free public transit passes to young people between the ages of 15 and 24, as well as for the first time, we are funding the Youth and Family Center to provide uh, youth programming uh, to kids in the near North Side and 14th Ward. And I'll share that collectively, these programs last year uh, according to our 2022 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, served over 1,500 children. Um, and that's not included, including the 1,000 bus passes. Um, for senior services, we are continuing to fund city seniors, as well as the St. Louis Area Agency on Aging, um, to provide uh, transit uh, to, to seniors, free rides, free meals, um, and other services uh, to seniors. Um, and they also serve about 1,500 seniors every year. Um, next, we are continuing to invest in a variety of food pantries and food access programs, including with the Carondelet Community Betterment Federation, uh, City Seniors Incorporated, uh, Guardian Angel Settlement Association, and Food Outreach. Um, and these also serve well over 1,000 individuals across the city and provide far more meals because they serve each individual multiple times. Um, in addition, uh, we are working with the Civil Rights Enforcement Agency of the city on a uh, housing discrimination uh, uh, awareness program to really make people aware of their rights and empower them to take action uh, to protect those rights um, with CREA and, and with other partners. Um, and then we are also continuing to fund Arch by Home Screen, um, produced by the Tower Grove Neighborhoods Community Development Corporation, which is a really neat system to empower tenants to find housing um, and is really designed, I, I think something I really appreciate about it is that landlords can only consider one tenant at a time. And, and so it really, I think, helps uh, uh, ensure uh, that at-risk renters are connected to housing and, and that ten and landlords can't discriminate against them. Next, we are continuing to fund the city councilor's office problem property team. Um, and the problem properties team uh, brings nuisance actions uh, uh, against vacant properties, goes after irresponsible landlords, and is really one of the most impactful uh, programs that we fund in terms of its ability uh, to, uh, to get results in terms of uh, either forcing the sale of a property or incentivizing the landlord to clean it up. And I'll mention that uh, it's especially uh, critical in light of the city's new private building stabilization program, uh, a $13 million program run out of the building division by which we can go out and bring buildings owned by private landlords up to code. But that involves a lot of legal work. We have to go through notice, we have to, uh, 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 and and not just notice, in certain cases, we may have to litigate these cases in order to recover from the landlord. Um, it's also critical uh, in order to run the city's special tax sale system. The city currently has about $11 million in outstanding um, uh, fines and fees on, on buildings where the landlord has not been maintaining them. And so we need the problem properties team to be fully staffed and, and funded in order to collect uh, collect these fines and fees, and in order to uh, go after irresponsible landlords, and ultimately help get these nuisance properties uh, up to code. We also uh, make significant investments in unhoused services, um, including Covenant House, uh, Gateway Homeless Services, Hope House, Doorways, St. Patrick Center, um, and, and St. Patrick Center. And collectively, these programs uh, house uh, more than 300 uh, individuals provide more than 300 um, shelter beds. Um, and uh, we're especially uh, uh, proud to fund Covenant House, which is the city's only youth shelter. Um, but honestly, we're proud to fund all of these partners. Um, and we're very lucky, I'll say, as a whole. CDA doesn't do any of this, provide any of these services services directly. We're really privileged to have a strong ecosystem of nonprofit partners that really do this work and deliver the impact. Um, we are also uh, awarded two reentry programs, uh, including the Criminal Justice Ministry and Employment Connection. And these are programs that we have funded uh, for a long time and support hundreds of individuals uh, as they uh, leave uh, jail 
uh, to re-enter to society, to provide access to housing, to provide access to workforce development services, mental health services, et cetera. Um, and then we also fund job training programs, uh, including with Employment Connection, uh, Launch Code, Mission St. Louis, the Urban League, and St. Patrick's Center. And I'll mention here, uh, last year, we served over 500 individuals uh, with these workforce development and job training programs. Two of these programs are new, the Employment Connection Green Jobs Program and the Launch Code Foundation Job Training Program. And we're really excited to launch uh, these programs uh, that are a little bit more targeted towards specific growth industries uh, in terms of coding and software, uh, as well as uh, the green infrastructure sector. Um, and the Green Jobs Program is a really good fit as well as we work to, uh, we have recently applied uh, for about $14 million in solar for all funds um, to uh, pro provide energy efficient um, uh, and solar installation uh, on affordable housing. Um, more public services. This is really the longest piece uh, here. Um, and uh, we provide a variety of beautification public services including funding Operation Brightside, uh, which completed over 2,000 graffiti removals uh, last year, and Slaco's uh, Keeping It Clean Neighborhood Beautification Initiative, as well as Seed St. Louis, um, which uh, provides uh, support to community gardens and orchards across the city, um, and is also working to establish new orchards and expand uh, those community gardens. And we think this is really essential, given that the city has over 20,000 vacant properties um, if finding creative ways to bring them back online and activate them to provide an asset and transforming our vacant properties from a liability into an asset for the community. Um, another new program is uh, the, with the Department of Health, a $250,000 maternal health program, which will be deploying which uh, to provide baby boxes and other, uh, as well as educational support to new mothers, uh, obviously focused on low to moderate income mothers. Um, and I'll just share that this was a big priority for Mayor Jones, um, seeing uh, the need out of the community. Um, and we're really excited to start this program with the Department of Health. Um, and then finally, uh, we're providing uh, residential leadership training and capacity building um, uh, awards to Slaco and the Urban League. Um, and these are both uh, programs that we funded historically, and in particular, the Federation of Block Units has been funded for a long time um, and, and does wonderful work. With that, I'll transition now to the interim assistance portion. And again, this is really designed to activate uh, blighted properties and, and to beautify our neighborhoods. 1.777 million of these funds uh, is uh, allocated uh, as it was uh, last year as well to the Land Reutilization Authority. Uh, to provide lot maintenance uh, to their 10,000 parcels of vacant property, including 9,000 vacant lots. Um, and 500,000 is being established, uh, used to fund a new program, um, which uh, grew out of uh, collaboration with the Vacancy Collaborative um, and to fund uh, essentially we're thinking about, we're calling them community development grants, but another thing we might call them is just quick wins grants. They're really small grants, less than $10,000 to for a neighbor to beautify a vacant property um, or, or uh, for a community garden or what have you. And just looking for those uh, creative uh, quick wins that we can deploy across the city uh, and make a difference um, uh, at a smaller scale. Um, and uh, excited uh, to see, uh, this is the first time doing this and really excited to see what people will propose. Um, and then uh, additionally, uh, we, uh, Moving on now to homeowner assistance, we are continuing to support the housing partnerships down payment assistance program. The way this program works is that when we build uh, a CDA funded or subsidized affordable home, we also like to provide down payment assistance. Uh, and so this is up to $10,000 of down payment assistance. I'll also share that even though it's not HUD funded, today we're talking only about HUD programs, but there is an ARPA funded uh, down payment assistance program, which will be launched before the end of the year and provide up to $50,000 of down payment assistance. Um, and we're really excited uh, to be working on that in partnership with the St. Louis Development Corporation and Stiefel um, to set up that larger down payment assistance program. We also uh, continue to support uh, our healthy home repair program. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more, but yes, there's a whole slide on home repair. Um, we're really proud of our home repair program um, because it provides critical services to um, 
in particular senior low to moderate income homeowners, although we serve any low to moderate income homeowners, but it's so critical because we know that there are uh, about 14,000 cost burdened homeowners in the city of St. Louis who can't afford the maintenance on their properties. Um, and that's why we have a wait list of about a thousand individuals. Um, and the need here is just extraordinary. Um, and that's why uh, we've been working really hard to scale the program. Tommy, if you can go to the next slide. Um, or actually, yeah, there we go. Uh, that's why we've been working really hard to scale the program and in fact have scaled from completing 155 uh, serving 155 homeowners last year to this year, we've served 288 homeowners to date uh, in 2023. And that expansion of the program, which to be clear, still is not enough to meet the extraordinary need, which we have a wait list of 1,000. But that expansion has been driven primarily by the infusion of $15 million in ARPA funds. And you can see the expenditures in that table on the bottom that last year we spent about $2 million. This year, we're on track to spend closer to $4 million. Um, and, and it, it just could not be more critical. We are also working on an online intake portal because we know that one of the things that can be frustrating about the program is communication and knowing the status and where you are in the process. And so we're working to establish that online portal where you'll be able to follow your application and, and know exactly where you are in the process. Um, and uh, I'll also share that uh, one of the things that has accelerated as well on the ARPA side is the fact that we are able to, uh, we don't no longer need to provide uh, historic and environmental reviews uh, under the ARPA guidelines, but that is still a requirement under the HUD program. And so that's why HUD funded home repairs go a little bit slower. Um, and we'll con continue to expand this and continue to invest in this um, over the coming years. Um, next slide. Um, with that, the next category is our affordable housing construction and rehab program. Um, this year, we've allocated uh, a $5.5 million uh, to affordable housing production and preservation, and those funds will be awarded to specific projects pursuant to our February spring housing production NOFA, um, and looking forward to seeing those applications. We also set aside $2 million for the St. Louis Housing Authority to bring 127 units of uh, vacant properties online. And the reason that this is uh, so critical is because we have, and you can see in the tables below, we have 36,500 cost burden tenants in the city of St. Louis. That's about 45% of city tenants are, tenant households are cost burden. And collectively, and when we say cost burden, what that means is that they pay more than 30% of their income towards rent and utilities. And when you do the math, when you look at how much they're paying versus how much they can afford to pay 30% of their income, that difference sums up to $170 million a year. Um, and that's $170 million a year of wealth transferred from low to moderate income tenants to their landlords. Um, and so we are really prioritizing rental housing, but we're also really prioritizing um, the highest impact, biggest bang for your buck investments that we can make to bring uh, more rental housing online. And the answer to that isn't just building new housing, although that's a piece of the puzzle. It's also taking the 1,500 vacant units in the city of St. Louis, which are vacant for want of five to $20,000 in investment um, because they need new appliances, drywall repair, uh, new furnishings, or, or what have you. It's minor stuff but it's preventing these units from coming back online because those owners don't have the liquidity because it is really difficult and expensive to manage affordable housing uh, in general, but especially now and here. And they don't have that liquidity to bring these vacant units online. And the housing authority especially is incredibly strapped for resources as they have our stewards over the arguably most vulnerable community in the city. Um, and so we are supporting the housing authority in bringing these 127 units online at a, uh, expense of about a little under uh, 15000 a unit. Um, and that's terribly exciting because typically it costs us over $100,000 to get a unit, to build a new unit or to rehab a unit. And this is really a high impact investment. Um, and then finally, there's a million dollars for our housing team. Um, we have a, a wonderful housing team uh, made up of uh, our housing director, director, architect, engineers, housing analysts, um, and, and they manage our over uh, 79 
uh, housing awards, uh, some of which are HUD, some of which are ARPA funded. Um, so uh, a little bit more on, on the process and, and uh, the projects that we are funded funding. Uh, we are going to issue a housing production NOFA in February 2024. That'll be our next opportunity uh, for developers and, and nonprofits and others to apply for funding. Um, and then uh, once those awards are made um, in summer 24, typically we go through six to 12 months of pre-development before entering construction. Um, and beca uh, because these are HUD funds, every project prior to starting construction must complete section 106 environmental and historic review must have a section three compliance plan um, and, and before we go to execute the contract and disperse funds. We also need a final budget and design drawings. Um, and then at a high level, I'll share again that we have about over 200 for sale homes in the production pipeline uh, citywide, as well as uh, over 2,400 uh, rental units in the production pipeline pipeline. Um, and this is a pretty dramatic expansion of our production pipeline. Between 2015 and 2019, the city supported the construction of 1,261 affordable units, of which only 39 were uh, affordable at under 30% AMI, and only 65 were for sale homes. Um, so we are really leveraging both HUD funds as well as the uh, one-time ARPA funds to dramatically expand and, in fact, over double our affordable housing production pipeline. And not only are we doubling it, we're really also trying to diversify it so that we add in housing that is really as diverse as our city in terms of meeting the needs of the unhoused with investments into tiny homes and permanent supportive housing, meeting the needs of the tenants uh, who has I mentioned are dramatically overpaying and need more access to affordable housing, but also meeting the need of upwardly mobile families who need access uh, to affordable for sale housing in order to build wealth, strengthen neighborhoods, and knit the fabric of our neighborhoods back together. Next, uh, we move on to public improvements, and there we are funding Habitat for Humanity uh, to provide uh, various transit uh, walkability uh, uh, mobility improvements uh, in Hyde Park and Old North. And this is as uh, a kind of uh, attachment to a previous award um, of $5 million in ARPA funds for Habitat for Humanity to build 19 homes uh, in new single family affordable homes in Hyde Hyde Park and Old North. And so as folks are moving into these blocks and these neighborhoods, we want to make sure that they are ADA accessible, that they are safe, uh, and, and that uh, we have walkable communities. We are also continuing to support the 5908 Etzel Community Center with Cornerstone. This $62,500 award is on top of a ARPA award of, I think, about $250,000 um, and uh, is really intended uh, to uh, create a space for the community and dovetails with other investments that we're making in the West End, including the recently completed Etzel Place 6 uh, project, a 98 unit multifamily development that's just down the street, as well as over a dozen single family homes on Cates, Cabany and Vernon, um, as well as uh, an early childcare center um, that's being uh, uh, established on page uh, with the favored foundation, which you can see down to, two bullets down, uh, will provide uh, 40 seats of early child care, uh, again, in the West End. Um, and so it's really about holistic neighborhood revitalization. The West End has a wonderful neighborhood plan that was recently adopted by the Planning Commission, um, and we are trying to deploy funds to implement it uh, insofar as we can, and such that the whole can be greater than the sum of its parts. We are, Tommy, this is a out of date version of these slides, but uh, we'll move on. Um, City of St. Louis Recreation Center improvements. Um, we are awarding $1.968 million uh, for City of St. Louis rec centers uh, to support new roofs, electrical panels, um, so that we can, um, uh, we can bring those rec centers um, and, and serve families uh, across our city. This again has been a big priority for Mayor Jones, uh, who recently uh, pushed to extend the hours of our rec centers uh, to 1 a.m., uh, and we want to make sure that these rec centers um, are uh, are uh, in the shape that 
honestly, our community deserves. Um, and, and these investments are long overdue. And I should flag also dovetail with over two and a half million dollars in ARPA investments in our rec centers, as well as additional capital committee investments. And there's just a lot of different funding streams that are going into the city rec centers to do those roof replacements, electrical panels, HVAC systems, and other critical repairs. We're also supporting Jubilee Community Development Corporation. Um, and we're, this this 1.358 million is for the rehab of Elliott School. Um, and uh, it again dovetails, um, which is, uh, it, it's in College Hill slash O'Fallon, right on the edge. Um, and, and it really dovetails with, again, another ARPA award of 500,000 for the same project, as well as the award I mentioned earlier of home ARP funds to convert the economy in on North Grand into permanent supportive housing. And the purpose here is really to serve unhoused individuals and in particular individuals uh, struggling with opiate addictions, fentanyl uh, and, and other addictions um, with both 20 units of permanent supportive housing, but also um, supportive services, mental health supports, et cetera. Next, moving on to economic development. Um, you'll see that we are continuing to fund the St. Louis Development Corporation's facade and public improvements program, um, as well as Justine Peterson's microenterprise technical assistance and training program, um, which provides uh, low interest loans uh, to small businesses uh, in order to uh, empower prospective entrepreneurs. And then finally, we come to the planning and administration section um, where we are, uh, we, it, it takes money to spend money. Um, we need lawyers at the city councilor's office. We need grants administrators and community development specialists and grants managers and project managers at CDA. Uh, we need uh, our uh, accounting team uh, at the comptroller's office and city planners at the planning and urban design agency, as well as our partners at SLDC uh, who support us in terms of finding contractors for our home repair program, MWBE compliance, uh, capacity building for minority contractors. And then we are for the first time uh, funding Project Connect um, directly um, through CDA with CDBG funds. And Project Connect is uh, the area focused on six target neighborhoods uh, on the near north side of St. Louis, Carr Square, Columbus Square, Hyde Park, Jeff Vanderloo, Old North, uh, and um, St. Louis Place, excuse me. Um, and uh, it's really focused on harnessing the opportunity presented by the $2 billion new NGA campus by uh, the proposed north-south Metrolink route, which goes up Jefferson, and thinking about going through a community-driven process to think about our goals and objectives and vision for each of these neighborhoods um, and, uh, and to ultimately develop neighborhood plans. Um, and this is really essential because we know that with this $2 billion facility and with light rail, these neighborhoods will change and how can we ensure that the community is in the driver's seat? And this work has already been gone going, um, but it uh, does require additional funding uh, and this will support it. And there are in fact already six neighborhood committees um, made up of us, of residents of those neighborhoods um, and, and open to, to, to uh, they, they actually, they were going to do random selection, but they wound up just inviting everyone who applied to serve on those steering committees to serve on the steering committee. Um, and so it's a very open process um, and excited to see the neighborhood plans that come out of it. So with that, that finally brings us to a close. I know that was a lot. Thank you all for your patience um, and uh, happy to, uh, again, this is out of date. That should say public comment and questions, uh, but uh, excited to hear from you all. Take your time. So it's just like that. I'll just go on like this. Let's just like you want to use it to say the money. Like you need to share on it. There there be a That's right. North Newstead, uh, we have historically funded North Newstead, uh, but, and we are continuing to fund North Newstead with 450, 90,000 in ARPA funds. 
um, that were awarded to North Newstead. But this year, unfortunately, through the competitive process, North Newstead was rated under the 85 point threshold. Um, I can't speak to speci specifically those ratings, but I can share that in general, North Newstead submitted four programs. Um, one was a $75,000 request for public safety uh, for their safety, um, so crime prevention uh, work that rated at 79.21. Um, and it's not a commentary on the program because actually last year that would have been enough to be funded, but it's a testament to the extremely strong funding round um, that we had this year. Um, and that the threshold was at 90 points for new programs and 85 points for previously funded programs. Um, but it, it is, uh, we strongly encourage North Newstead to apply again next year. Um, and, uh, but we, we did go through our rating process and uh, unfortunately, uh, they did not rate above that threshold. Not through this process, because again, we already went through our rating process, and this is what HUD has required us to do, is we hold a competitive process, uh, and we rate everything, and then we award the highest rating process, projects. And so we can't undermine the integrity of that process without getting slapped by HUD. That said, um, we are funding North Newstead, again, with 490000 in ARPA funds. Um, and on top of that, if we're talking specifically about the crime prevention work, there is an RFP open right now in the Office of Violence Prevention that is an excellent fit for this kind of work, and we would strongly encourage North Newstead to apply. What about the, are you funding? I, I don't care. I'm not, I, I don't understand the whole process of how things are done, but are they being funded for um, seniors in their homes? Um, Home care and put you in like a home Just a quick comment. Like, they could you be your computer and your computer sound on? And I'm going to switch. Thanks. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, under the 2024 annual action plan, they are not receiving funding for those senior services. I know they've historically. You have had a $30,000 elderly services program. Unfortunately, that one also rated um, on the left 79.22. Um, and so uh, they are not being funded for that support. But again, there are other funding opportunities with the St. Louis Area Agency on uh, aging. Um, but, and, and there's always uh, future funding cycles as well. But unfortunately, we have to follow the integrity of our process. We, love working with North Newstead. Um, they're some of our favorite partners. Uh, and we also, I'll note, um, not only uh, awarded $490,000 to North Newstead through ARPA, but have also been working uh, with other partners, including the St. Louis Equity Fund, to uh, secure additional support for North Newstead as well. Uh, we value our partnership with North Newstead, but unfortunately, we can't undermine the integrity of our process. But we are happy to engage in follow-up conversations with these partners in terms of uh, exploring other funding opportunities. Well, the reason I speak on that is because there, that area, um, the home of the seniors in that area, as they ASD age out and not have our home, you know, kept up in good condition, um, then, then we have, have to move out or leave the city, which is like from my perspective. But I, I would hate to see any of my fellow uh, seniors lose their home uh, because they can't be fair. Because, you know, most of us are on fixed income. So, whereas if you want to get a repair done uh, on your own without assistance, it really costs you a lot. I, I couldn't agree more. I totally <laughs> understand the need. Um, and in fact, that is why we have allocated $15 million in ARPA funds to expand our home repair program. And why we have provided this year 200, over 288, um, and, and that's over 140 more than we did last year home repairs. These are major home repairs, $10,000 uh, on average uh, home repairs. 
And so by comparison, just to, so we can be specific, the North Newstead Elderly Services Program was a $30,000 program um, that was, uh, it wasn't directly providing this on the payer side. Um, and so I actually think we are investing dramatically in order to meet the needs that you have identified. So next year, you said that they can apply again. So you also talked about this 25-29. So that's that's that five-year five year plan that you're talking about? Sort of. Um, the five-year plan doesn't award money. It just says, here are our five-year goals, objectives, but then simultaneously, we will be doing our 2025 action plan. So this, I just presented on our 2024 action plan. We'll be doing the same thing again next year with our 2025 action plan. And we strongly encourage those applications. We also strongly encourage um, you all to engage in the consolidated plan process, because that's how we say, what are our goals in terms of how many housing units do we want to produce? How many crime prevention events do we want to hold? How many lots do we want to be involved, right? So when we set those goals, we have to, we have scarce resources, right? So we can't do everything 100%. We have to figure out what are the smart attainable goals. And those priorities are going to guide then how we review ratings, um, how, how we review projects and how we score projects in terms of how much they advance those goals. Um, in a way, um, and when you say recyclable, I'm going to interpret that as two things that I could imagine it being. One is some of our activities generate program income, right? Uh, so, for example, when we fund certain uh, child care services, right, some of those involve some fees. And those are called program income, and they do need to come back and then be reinvested back into the same program. So that's an example, or an even better example is with... Uh, uh, our housing construction, right? Um, if uh, the individual uh, resells the home, then there's an agreement in place that we recapture a, a piece of that uh, as well. Uh, so that's all program income, and that's a recycle pool in a way, and that comes back in and is subject to all the same rules that the CDBG talked about. Um, so that's one example. In terms of, say, the project doesn't happen, right? Or, or a project doesn't uh, uh, spend all of their money. Then we go through what is called a substantial amendment process, um, which is essentially what we have to do uh, is we have to, and actually the process is different depending on whether it's over 15% or not of our annual allocation, um, but let's assume it is. Let, uh, we have to go through another public hearing process and we submit it to HUD and say, HUD, we want to take this $2 million uh, that we uh, we aren't able to spend on what we said we would in our action plan, and instead we want to spend it on X, Y, Z. Um, and X, Y, Z is can be either public entities, in which case we won't open that up for competitive funding, right? We'll just say Department of Health or Building of or whoever they can use it for X, Y, Z. But what we also often do is that we will fold it into our annual funding cycle, right? So that's actually what we did this year. Um, what we did this year in 2024 is we said we actually have almost $5 million of funds that are not going to be spent on what they were originally allocated to. Um, and that's why uh, we uh, uh, include, we, we invited applications for that uh, this year in our funding cycle. And in fact, if you look at our awards, the total awards that we're making are $5 million more uh, than our 2024 allocation, because essentially we are substantially amending uh, uh, what we're uh, uh, reprogramming 4.99 million. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know, well, if we can, we have some uh, questions uh, coming in from Zoom. There are two that are similar. Um, basically, uh, could you describe who the, the raters or graders are? And then in terms of CDA staff, um, are we diverse? Do we live north of Page specifically? Do we live all over the city? And what's uh, CDA 
staff in terms of our raters, um, could you talk about some of our experience in community development and nonprofit experience? Sure. Uh, we have a very diverse staff. Uh, I can't quote you the numbers off the top. I don't know if any of our team wants to quickly uh, assess some numbers, but um, we, we do have a, an extremely diverse uh, staff in terms of uh, geographic residency, in terms of age, in terms of race, in terms of gender. Um, and the staff are the ones who do it. With that said, uh, something that I want to explore in the consolidated planning process is a community rating. Uh, because I do think that long-term democratizing CDA and democratizing this process is really critical. Um, and so I only got here a year ago and inherited a lot of processes. Um, and, and one of these is this internal rating process. Um, but actually, historically, back in 2015 and 2016, mm -hmm. there was a community rating access. Could you uh, turn your mic on the computer? Okay. And I'm going to turn. Were folks able to hear that? Should I restate all of that? I think we're okay just for the next points. Um, and then for the next questions, we'll uh, just ask you to repeat them for as long as yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is there anything? No, just at, at a high level, we do have a diverse team with significant experience in community development um, and, and who has managed these programs for decades uh, combined, probably have. 50 years uh, or more. I, unfortunately, I don't have this information off the top of my head, but we can provide it. Um, but they have experience managing these programs. Uh, and uh, I've been really impressed um, with our, our team uh, and uh, their ability to identify both challenges and opportunities that programs may face um, instantly and well before um, uh, I, I see them and, 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 uh, and we're fortunate to have a great team. But with that said, we also want to incorporate a community rating process as an element of our process. We won't stop staff rating, um, but we want to have more community input on the front end. We have one more question from our uh, attendees on Zoom. This question is, um, I think, related to the timeline. Basically, where are these recommendations now? Um, have they gone? The Board of Aldermen processes? Um, are they awaiting signatures that have been legislated? If you could just tell us where these are in terms of becoming legislation and then uh, what role this community uh, public input has. Yes. Um, so, as I mentioned at the top, this is actually the third public hearing that we're holding as part of this funding cycle. Um, the first one was at the beginning before we even issued uh, the RFP. The second one was at the HUDS committee um, while the Board of Aldermen uh, had the board bill in front of them. And this is a final one once the board bill has been passed uh, to inform the public of the final awards uh, and invite recommendations uh, for uh, for the future. We will always, uh, our responsibility and our requirement is to respond to public comment. Um, but for all the reasons I've stated previously in terms of a competitive process uh, a, and uh, a, a, and the fact also, let me flag, that we have this public services cap. Uh, because if we were uh, to reallocate funds or, or change funds at this point, it wouldn't just mean adding funds for North Newstead. It would also mean taking funds away from another uh, organization that's been awarded funds for public services and rated higher. Um, so I know uh, that that feels harsh, but we have to follow our ratings. Um, that's really the only fair way to do it. Um, but as discussed, um, I, I do think that democratizing uh, our rating process and opening it up is a long-term goal. Um, thank you for your second. And I'm going to turn this mic on. Uh, we don't have any more questions from Zoom, so if there's any in the room. If you can just project from where you are. Okay. Yeah. So the question I, I saw up there on your slide with some information concerning the like and how specifically you work with that community that or those communities that have been raised by in order to ensure that they actually get funding 
or seek organization in that community. Uh, the folks who I say that we need to be going to that community to actually take the lead in going to that community to say we know we need to realign the city to be specific and therefore we are going to uh, put this in place so that you can do this and we're going to manage it in order to tap to get rid of what was prior when you see organizations that um, or in that community that can ask for specifics concerning some of the big lines that took place. Great question. Uh, and yes to all of the above, in particular with how we are administering. Is it unmute on yours? I know this is. All right. Um, yes, in particular with how we've administered American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, we have not used redlining as an explicit as an explicit factor for CDBG funds yet. Again, that's something as we enter our consolidated planning process, it's an opportunity uh, to really have this dialogue about what our criteria are and our priorities are. But I can tell you that with the American Rescue Plan Act funds, one of the criteria by which we awarded bonus points um, was the Economic Justice Index. And the economic justice index, one of those variables is, has the community been redlined in the past? Another one is uh, how average household income. Another one is uh, health uh, life expectancy. Another one is violent crime rate. Another one is educational team. Another one is access to internet. So we are really trying to prioritize communities that have been historically marginalized and disinvested in and reverse uh, that because we know that that disinvestment was a product of public policy. Um, it was a product of restrictive covenants and redlining and appraisal gaps and white flight and highways destroying neighborhoods. Um, and that in order to rebuild our neighborhoods and revitalize that neighborhood, it's gonna take the same level of intentionality and creativity in the opposite direction. Um, and so if you look at our map of awards, um, and I'm sorry, we don't have one here, we probably should have, but you will see that it is concentrated in the areas of the city um, with the highest levels of need, uh, including both North St. Louis, but also pockets of Dutchtown and Gravoy Park uh, and Mount Pleasant. So, morning. My name is Charles Bryce. I, my comments are to be viewed as I am a private citizen. Uh, I'm here to testify about the recommendation, not just by what was said was 24 cities to go. As you all know, North has been a beacon of support for North St. Louis residents for decades. Uh, since 1993, in fact, has been a force uh, to help stabilize North St. Louis community residents. I would never come to question the staff of TV, of the EDA. I would, however, especially with some of the qualifications and questions were related to the points that were awarded. Um, and also, while I'm not a fan of legacy, uh, I think the impact that the North Newstead Association has had on North St. Louis, when you say Page, when you say Del Mar, um, and I think the people here today are here because of their concern that a new entity will come in not knowing them, not knowing the history, not knowing the lifestyle that folks live, not understanding how to get things done in a timely manner, will only hurt the process. And, and I think that is something that should also be taken into consideration. When you change ownership of the dollars, you also change the philosophy of the organization and how they're going to use those dollars in the community. So I noted that you had a 79.1 or 79.2 rating. Again, I don't know what the rating was based on. Certainly don't know what questions were asked, but I do know this. North Houston has been an important partner for a lot of people and a lot of organizations in North St. Louis. And at some point, that should be accounted for. Maybe not this round, which conceivably might be over, but in the consideration of the years of service and commitment, every neighborhood organization, every neighborhood meeting I go 
to their act. So one of us doesn't sleep at night, but because they're there and because they're a force, people come to them and ask them for questions. People ask them for support. They're an important element of our state. And that has to, in some reference, account for something. So with that, um, I certainly thank you all for the opportunity. I look forward to working and engaging with you all in the future. I'm a fan of Fort Lisbeth, obviously, but I'm a fan because they do the work. And that has to count for something. Thank you, sir. Uh, it certainly does count for a lot. And we, again, value our partnership uh, with North Newstead and are in no way divesting generally from North Newstead. Uh, again, we just awarded $490,000 uh, to North Newstead for beautification. To your point about the ownership of the funds, which I, I think is really important to your point. Uh, so historically, North Newstead received three awards the Crime Prevention Award for about $70,000, the Senior Service Award for about $30,000, and the Beautification Award for about $35,000. So that's a total, first of all, of about, what, 60, 140, 150,000 uh, is the historic funding level. Um, and again, we just awarded $490,000 um, to be spent over three years. So you can see that the overall level of funding is relatively stable, if not increased. Um, but second, with respect to those three programs and ownership, safety, elderly, and beautification, beautification certainly remains uh, a North Newstead project and investment. With respect to public safety uh, and crime prevention, um, we did not award a crime prevention alternative. There, there's not another entity that's going to be taking that on. Now, I will say again that my broad suggestion on crime prevention is to go to the Office of Violence Prevention because we at CDA are not experts at crime prevention. We're experts at community development, um, but the Office of Violence Prevention has an RFP open now. Um, it, it is open um, where they are awarding millions of dollars for crime prevention. Um, and so that, that would be my strong recommendation on that. And then as for senior services, you saw that we awarded two senior services contracts to Seniors Inc. and the St. Louis Area Agency on Aging. So again, not uh, necessarily Put, uh, replacing one program with another. Uh, th those are programs that we funded historically for a long time. Um, and so this is not, it certainly wasn't an intentional comment on North Newstead. It was just the outcome of our rating process. Um, and we look forward to engaging in a dialogue with the community and with you, with you all and with the community over the coming year about our processes uh, and how we can strengthen them. Because that's a conversation I'm really eager to have. Um, finally, uh, to your point uh, about uh, what are the criteria, at a very high level, and we did actually share the scorecard with North Newstead for their review so that they know um, the points and, and, and uh, the, the priorities, but at a very high, and I'm not going to go through a very detailed scorecard right now, but at a very high level, we look at two, two or three things. One, we look at qualifications and experience, right? Can you do what you propose? Do. Is it financially feasible? Do you have that capacity? Um, and North Newstead obviously does very well on that typically um, because we funded them for a long time. And that is also where that track record of success comes in. The second place where it comes in is impact, um, essentially, um, and, and need. Um, and that's the and there's a lot of questions that we ask and a lot of different pieces to that. But and I can't comment on why the projects didn't score as well as they may historically have or why. I really think a lot of it was it was a very strong funding round in general. Um, but uh, we are, again, happy to continue to engage and debrief and, and, and continue those discussions. And I want to emphasize that CDA's funding for North Newstead remains strong uh, overall. It's just shifted from CDBG to ARPA briefly, but we strongly encourage uh, North Newstead to reapply in the future. And we encourage North Newstead to explore other funding opportunities with the Office of Violence Prevention and possibly others as well. And we're happy to be partners in making uh, North Newstead aware of those.
And during the past, since COVID, they have really helped help seniors in that they have uh, helped us with our uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, because without them, a lot of seniors would have been disconnected uh, from other people. But this weekly Zoom and uh, uh, all of that, that that was going on, everybody have high praise for them. These are small things to other people, but they're large things for for us, especially those uh, that are elderly. They not only um, help with with uh, with the viewing of our uh, meetings, they come out and they help seniors with uh, computers and you know, some of all the logistics stuff. So, I, you know, I, I don't know how people score, what they know about the, the small things that are large to, to the community that they do with sports for. But in the future, I, I would so hope that, you know, they take into consideration. And I don't know if you received the letter from, from me, but I would like to read it and maybe whoever does the review could uh, take this letter into consideration. We also had people to sign off on sort of a petition that uh, spoke to this. That's just a comment that I have. Thank you for that comment and thank you for that. So the public has access to the ratings and criteria for ratings? Uh, North Newstead does. Um, oh, okay. uh, and, and they can share it internally, but we can also provide it to you. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out this week. It's all here. My name is Constance. I am the director of the North Newstead Association, the one organization that we've been talking a lot about here um, at the public hearing. Two things that our board members wanted to, to think about when we were considering whether or not North Newstead to issue a public statement was question number one. Will these programs exist despite North Newstead not receiving the funding? The second was, in light of the financial challenges that are faced by community development corporations like North Newstead that has been around for 30 years, what else can you guys do to us besides take away the funding? Um, so I'm here to share what I know. I don't know if funding decisions are going to change. I don't know if these of us showing up at the public hearing is going to change our I don't know if recommendations have ever been changed, but what I do know is that Fort Newstead is a 30-year old organization. We've been in community, as Charles said, for a very long time. We're responsive when we show up at community meetings and we stay until the end because we don't see our safety program as an isolated program. We don't see elderly services as an isolated program. We don't see beautification and minor home care and all of those programs as an isolated program. We see them as interacting with one another, and that is the value of having a CDC provide these services because our folks who are participating in our elderly service program are also the resident leaders in our safety program, are also the folks who are seeking home repair. We're working to keep communities grounded and in place. And how do we do that? We do that through community development that has programs that hit all of these different programs. What I do know is that the programs that North Newstead delivers, the quality that we deliver it at, the responsiveness that we deliver it at, that is not gonna be there next year. I talk to so many people in community where there are larger organizations that are getting the dollars that they don't, community members don't see those organizations in their community. But North Newstead is here. What I do know is that federal and state funds are really difficult to manage. And Time and time and time again, North Newstead is described as the model organization when it comes to compliance reporting. It's a slap in the face when we go to meetings and they say, North Newstead, you are a model organization. However, we're not going to give you any funding for 2024. I understand that there's a change in the scoring, but what Charles said in terms of longevity of programs is important. What I know is that consistent funding has allowed North Newstead to improve our program year after year to grow our program year after year, to make sure that we're still meeting community needs, to make sure that we're flexible so that we can meet the needs that Ms. Rosa talked about, of providing the one-on-one -on -one uh, support. The 
the pandemic happened after funding decisions were made during the pandemic. And then we went out because we chose, because we knew that there were folks going to be left behind. We chose to pivot our program so that we can still address the needs of the community. If it's a larger organization, that may not be out. I know that our program, although it's labeled as crime prevention, that's a program where North Houston staff members attend over 30 meetings every year. We're there until the very end. Calls right, we barely sleep because we know that this is important. We know that listening into community is important. And we know that the reason why so many people still engage in our program is because we help build the capacity of those organizations. We know that across the board neighborhoods don't look alike. We know that power doesn't look alike from one place to another. But what can North Newstead do as a meso-level community development to support the micro-level community development, to make sure copies are getting made, to make sure mailings are going out, to make sure seniors who don't have emails still get the flyer so they can still attend the neighborhood event they want to go to. So the unsaid thing of North Newstead supporting the capacity of existing organizations and allowing neighborhood associations to do their work is something that's not captured in the report, uh, in the scoring part that we have now. So, I know North East said we have a strong history. I know that federal funds are hard to manage. I know that we're a model organization. I know that consistent program has allowed us to improve on it. And I know that funding decisions have been made, but the funding decisions made, and we were shared this information two months before the end of the year. That's two months to pivot programs that have been funded for over seven, eight, nine years. So as of December 31st, these programs are going to evaporate. Yes, we will explore other options with uh, the Office of Violence Prevention, with Senior Fund, and other organizations to provide these services, but there's going to be a lag. There's going to be a gap. And whether or not the, another organization that was funded is able to ground themselves in community in the meantime and provide the same responsive work that meets the community need, that's something I don't know. I just want to say more things. In discussion today, uh, I am no longer a city resident. And that is because I was on a waiting list before the um, pandemic came about. The house that I lived in was uh, the early leave. And Healthy Homes both came out and did assessment. And they were supposed to do repairs to, uh, I had a flood in my basement, which knocked out my heating unit uh, and my um, heating and uh, water, uh, my water tank. They were coming in, they were going to do this and do that. He was asking, you know, about making changes from my, uh, from my uh, heating, from uh, radiator heat to forest heat. I mean, it was a plan that they were going to do. This is, this is from the early meetings. It never happened. And, and when I was called back and asked for uh, the person that was working with me, they would tell me where they, they got to get with their supervisor. This went on and on. Cold is here. Then they, when I when we got back on base, they said they didn't have people to do the repairs. They didn't have uh, the materials to do the repairs. As a result, I wind up having to sell my home and move out. I would hate to have that happen to somebody else. They, these people didn't know me because they weren't in my neighborhood. So I, don't, I can't say they didn't care. I don't, I don't say they evidently didn't care enough. But had that been monies that were allocated in large sums for, for this part of the city, North City, and came through North Houston or other community uh, uh, associations in, in that area, I believe knowing the people that need the help that, that help would have been got. Because all the other things that I did ask of the North Houston when I had to leave the, the premises, <laughs> my home, 
they did. The grass cutting is something that is very important. Um, I had a tree that limbs to fall off the tree. It got cut up, cut up and stacked away. Those are small things to other people, but it was very large to me. So I'm pretty sure that there are other people in the, in the room that may have issues that seem like little small issues. But if you go to them and ask for help, you got that help. Or you, and you were referred to someone that could help you and you didn't have to pay astronomical amounts to get it done. It's absolutely essential, which is why we are expanding our investment in both home repair and broader neighborhood beautification activities, including with North Houston. Um, I, I want to make a comment also just uh, constant to your point about the potential lag uh, is that something that we can look at is extending or amending the 23 contracts um, in, in order to, in conjunction with other funding sources, see what we can do to minimize the operational impact. There are other organizations we have funded in the past that have missed a funding cycle or, or missed funding, and we've been able to kind of smooth it out uh, in terms of how we administer the awards. So those are conversations that we can have. And I really want to be clear that the fact that these funds were not awarded this year is not a reflection or commentary overall on the value of North Newstead. We have an immense, and I think it's a testament to the value and impact of North Newstead, you all coming out, and I really appreciate you all being here today. Um, and we are we are in relationship, in partnership uh, on a variety of fronts, um, and, and we look forward to continuing to work with North Newstead so that you can continue to serve the people in this room and the community in North St. Louis. You've mentioned the 490 that North Newstead has received in ARPA dollars. I think it's misleading to say that we both got both. It said the 490 is specifically for beautification only. It's not going to allow us to support the existing program of elderly services and yes. safety and beautification. So I want to make that clear for the folks in the room that y'all know that we got the 490, but that does not mean that we can continue to support the programs that we have to do. Are there any other questions or comments? Do we have any other questions or comments online? All right. With that, thank you all very much for your time and your engagement. I really strongly encourage you all to engage in our consolidated planning process as we can talk about our priorities and our rating process uh, in more depth. Thanks, everyone.